fortunate today to be joined by Dan Spalding. She is um, very involved in our local community. She is a pastor over at Quest Church, the Compassion and Justice pastor for that um, local church, just close here down by the school in the Ballard Inner Bay area. And she's been actively involved at Quest for the last 10 years. And a lot of her work has focused around social justice outreach and compassion ministries to the local community. So um, along the way, Deanza decided that she wasn't busy enough with her work at the church, but she also wanted to get her degree and um, become a counselor. And so she's now actively involved in private practice also in the Seattle area. And so as a pastor, as a person of faith, as a person who uh, cares about the needy and um, the loss and the broken in our community, she's coming here today to talk to us about how she integrates her faith with her work. And um, I think it'll be tremendously inspiring to us. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll leave some time at the end then for that as well, maybe about 15 minutes at the end. By the way, I'm Dr. Margaret Brown. I'm the chair of the psychology department. And would you please give a warm welcome to Dan Spalding. Well, thank you. It is so good to be here with you today. And it's so exciting to see so many of your faces. I wasn't exactly expecting to see so many of you here. So it feels like a really warm welcome. And I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you some of my own personal journey and my experience, um, both working as a pastor here in the local community, but also as a private practitioner in the Green Lake area. Um, like I shared, I've been doing kind of a bivocational track for the last 10 years, and I feel really blessed because uh, God has given me just a lot of opportunity to continue to just deepen um, myself and my passions in regards to working with those that are marginalized and on the fringes in our communities. We do a lot of work through Quest, um, providing just outreach, case management, <laughs> referral services, and just building deeper relationships with those that are homeless in our community there. But one of the things that I felt that was really important for me um, as I continued my work as a pastor was also to figure out how to do this other piece of work. And that's just a more kind of deeper opportunity to journey alongside people in kind of a therapeutic setting. And so about three years into my tenure at Quest, I also start, started a private practice and I've been kind of juggling both over the past 10 years. And so as I was getting ready for our conversation today, um, there was a couple of questions that were posed to me. And these questions included, how do these vocations work in tandem? How does my faith inform my work as a therapist? As well as how does my practice as a therapist inform my work as a minister, and do they influence each other? Should they influence each other, or should they remain separate entities? Before I get farther along in my own personal story and journey, you know, I wanted to share just a, a short excerpt of a letter that was written to me by someone I worked with for several years, and I wanted to ask you to join me as I read this letter aloud. I'm terrified. I'm terrified to be here, and I'm more terrified to not. I was strongly encouraged to be here because there was no other places for me to go, but I don't know what we do here, and I'm not sure where to start. The reason why I'm in, I am here is because of him. When I met him, he seemed normal. The relationship prog progressed quickly, and the next thing I knew, I was moving in with him. I was so happy and I loved him so much, I just wanted to help him succeed in his business and build a happy home with him. At first, it seemed that things were good. But shortly after moving in together, he would get so angry. If he came home and things weren't just so, he'd get angry. After a month of living together, he became more hostile towards me. I worked to build up his business by creating his website, networking with other business people, and so on. But he never paid me for the work, and he became more agitated. And it was at this point that he began to insult me, yell at me, call me all kinds of names. I was com completely confused because I didn't understand 
what I had done to deserve this name calling. At times, he would get so angry that he would threaten me. He would threaten that if I left him, he would find me and he would hurt me. He would even tell this to my mother and he would say how no one would miss me or figure out that I was gone. But what really brought me to see you today was because of the time when he came home and he decided he'd try to put me through a glass door. I ran that day. I ran so hard and I never looked back. I left with all that was on me that day and here I am. Can you help me? Can you tell me why he would do these things to me? I think when we hear stories like these, stories of oppression, stories of fear, stories of isolation, of confusion, of doubt, of pain, these kinds of stories conjure something inside of us. They stir something inside of us to hear and to be participants in hearing the story. And it is compassion, it is empathy, it is tenderness that is stirred and provoked in us when we hear stories like these. Compassion stirs us. Compassion awakens us. It awakens our sight. It gives us the ability to see and to hear and to take steps to engage the other. It makes us alive and aware of those outward needs, those other centered needs. And it stirs us to begin to understand the reality of human suffering. We know human suffering on so many different levels. We see human suffering. We hear of human suffering all the time through the TV, through our radios, through what we read in the newspaper. We hear of people struggling with all kinds of suffering from trauma to oppression to discrimination to war to sex trafficking, all of these things are constantly before us. We also know of trauma or of suffering that is on an individual level, that is personal, personal realities like depression, mental illness, and the, sac the lack of self-value. And it is compassion that gives us the courage to move forward, to do something different to engage, to get invested, and to get involved. It is compassion that gives us the understanding of the individual struggle, struggle with homelessness, or genocide, or domestic violence, or bipolar, anxiety, and more. Compassion is what allows us to see men and women on our streets who are homeless, and it also allows us to read such tragedies as we see, saw this last few weeks with the murder-suicide of the Powell family. It's compassion that opens our senses and our ability to join and to engage others as they are suffering. These may not be our own personal struggles, but compassion leads us to a place to engage people who suffer in all kinds of ailments and situations. Compassion opens us, but also allows us to have the courage to move forward with someone. And it also gives us the strength and the ability to sustain as we join others in the long road to recovery, to healing, to restoration, and to reconciliation. This awakening of compassion is common among people who desire to serve. This is a common element for those both that find themselves in vocations of ministry and for those that find themselves working in more therapeutic settings and more clinical settings. In her book, The Suffering Human Being, Kate Erickson states, compassion can be interpreted as sensitivity to the pain 
and suffering of the other. The sensitivity or tenderness prepares us to struggle with the suffering of the other and to try to alleviate it. And so we see that this compassion lends us into a place to see our call to join others and to be with others. I hear stories all the time from both people that are practicing therapy to those that are in ministry settings where they share that there was a moment in which they heard a story, they engaged someone that was going through a difficult time and they realized that was in that moment that they wanted to be of help, that they wanted to be of assistance and where they heard their call so clearly on their lives. Mother Teresa felt her call to service at the age of 12. She understood at such an early age that people were in need and that people were suffering and she felt God's presence on her life calling her out to serve and to be with those that struggle so deeply. But it wasn't until she served in Calcutta, India that she actually referred to that time serving in Calcutta as the call within the call. This is where she felt that her giftings, her calling was being used to the very fullest extent in working with the poorest of the poor there in India. Karen Horney, a German-born psychotherapist, began to see folks come forward with, she was born in the 1800s, folks come forward with all kinds of issues around depression and despair and hopelessness to the point where people had suicidal ideation. And she wanted to understand as a means to help people, to come alongside people, to give people a sense of hope, dignity, she wanted to understand what they were going through so that she could be a source of light for them. So part of that meant that she devoted herself to understanding the self as a means to deconstructing the inner conflicts that cause psychological suffering. My point in all of this is that the premise to either the vocation to ministry or the vocation to do therapeutic work as a therapist, or to do research, or any other vocation, they're very common. They start at the same point. It's at that point of compassion, that desire to come alongside people in need. For me personally, I felt that pretty early on in my life. When I first began college, I started out as a music major. And I was actually working towards a degree to be an operatic singer, if you can believe it. <laughs> and at some point in that journey, as kindly as they could share with me, the professor said, this is absolutely not the place for you. You don't fit the bill. You're going to have to figure out another line of work, because this isn't going to work for you. <coughs> I was a bit disappointed, obviously. I felt pretty invested towards that journey towards music. But what it allowed me to do was to take a few moments to step back and to really do some soul searching and to really look at what I was good at and how it was that I felt like God might be calling me and what it was my gifts were. And I realized in that time that when I, I felt the most alive, when I felt the most like I was doing what I was created to do, was when I was listening to people and being with people in some of their darkest moments and days. And I remember that very early on, as I was doing this soul searching, I remember that Earlier on, when I was about 11 years old, I began to hear of issues of homelessness. And I began to feel dissatisfied with the reality that we had such a social ill on our hands. 
and I couldn't quite make sense of that. And so it was at that point in time in my college career that I decided to shift from my music focus into a focus of sociology, psychology. And after I graduated with my undergrad, I went on to work on a master's in counseling psychology at the Seattle School here in Seattle. My goal upon graduating from the Seattle School was to start a private practice. I was really gung-ho and ambitious and ready to just get my feet wet and just get right in there and start working one-on-one -on -one with individuals. But I graduated in August 2001. And as you know, 9-11 happened right after that. And when that happened, what I realized is that I didn't really have the means to start a private practice. And there really wasn't much work available for someone like me that was looking for something in kind of a clinical setting. And so I felt really discouraged. I began to ask myself again, what was my purpose? What was my calling? What was I supposed to be doing with my life after having gone through that long soul searching part in my story, but then getting the tools and the skills that I needed to take that next step. And here I was with a degree, and now I couldn't find any work. And it was, it was discouraging. It was a bit of a letdown. But then, shortly thereafter, I kept putting my nose to the grind, putting resumes out there, though I had very little work experience. And I got my first job with an organization called Friends of Youth. And I worked with homeless women, young women who were pregnant or parenting. And I was hired on as a case manager. And I was hired on to oversee this transitional housing facility out in Redmond. And it was here. At this point in my journey where I can truly say to you that my life was transformed and changed through working with these women and through the stories that I was able to engage on a daily basis. These women were amazing young women. So many of them had come from situations where poverty was just a generational situation that each of them faced. Many of them getting pregnant at a very young age, becoming displaced, parents and families disowning them because of their own personal choices, and then finding themselves at a place where they're homeless and no place else to go with very little to their name and very little hope of what their future would hold. And yet listening to their stories, and maybe at the time, sometimes I would feel like there was a sense of naivete. But now, looking back on it, in retrospect, there was this sliver of hope that continued to drive them to move forward, to better their lives, not only for themselves, but for their children. And I would see them work so hard to make changes, even the smallest of changes how it is they relate to one, another, to one another, how it is they raise their children, how it is they continue to stay in school. They would fight, and they would fight, and they would fight to, to create a better path for themselves and for their children. And there would be times and moments where there'd be great celebration as they triumphed in different areas of their lives. And there would be times of great sorrow as they felt discouraged over missed opportunities, or when old patterns of developing destructive relationships would come back to haunt them. And I was blessed because they invited me to be a part of all of that, of every aspect of their stories, the good, the bad, the wonderful, glorious, joyful, beautiful, and ugly. They invited me to be a part of the landscape of their stories. And it transformed me. It changed me. After working there for some time, I had the great privilege of finding Quest Church. Quest had just been planted about six months before 
my husband and I found the church. And they were getting ready to start this separate nonprofit, a community center, nonprofit cafe. Some of you might have, study, have studied there in the past, Q Cafe over there across Dravis and 15th. And they were looking for a community center director. And so I went through the process of um, interviewing and getting hired and they hired me. And so I came on as their first community center director of their very brand new community center and cafe. And I had no idea what that meant and neither did they. Um, so it was quite a fun journey that we got to be alongside each other for. But one of the hearts of what the cafe wanted to be is a good neighbor. And part of what that meant to be a good neighbor is to look up and to see that there were men and women that were homeless in our community. And so what did that mean? And how did we engage? And how we come alongside people? How do we build relationships with people? Those became some of the fundamental questions that I continue to ask myself and to ask us as a ministry. So my journey wasn't a straight journey. It was one that meandered and went in lots of different directions, had lots of different turns and lots of different bends in it. But I'm grateful for that because it's led me to where I'm at today. And it's led me to the passion that I feel and how it is we come alongside, alongside of people, how we serve our communities and how we serve each other and what that can look like. It wasn't the end result. Remember, the end result was to get to that private practice. It wasn't the end result that led me to where I'm at today, but it was the premise that led me to where, I was, to where I'm at today. It was the premise of compassion, of empathy, of wanting to understand what it must mean to be in another shoe, to be in another person's situation that is struggling and suffering with issues that I, on a personal level, know nothing about. And so it was that, it was that premise, it was that compassion that content, continued to drive me and to move me forward to the point in which I'm at today. To be able to serve in these bivocational settings, both as a minister and as a therapist, it's crazy. The journey has been crazy. But I want to also share that there's something that precedes compassion. Even something that comes before that awakening time where our senses are open to compassion and empathy, and that is story. It starts with story. Essentially, it starts with your story. It starts with my story, and it starts with the stories that we're invited to be part of and to participate with. It's your stories, your experiences, your personal journey, and it is the stories you're invited to hear, those stories that awaken you and change you and transform you. Those stories will proceed, even compassion. Every beginning, every dream, every starting point, point begins with story. So in order for our compassion to be roused and released, stories must be told and stories must be heard. Author Kathleen Norris said, we want to have meaning, want fulfillment, healing, and even ecstasy, but the human paradox is that we find these things by starting where we are not where we wish to be. You see, I hadn't planned on working long term with men and women who are homeless. But 
these stories of these women in this transitional housing facility at Friends of Youth changed me completely, opened me to see in a completely different light, and to have hope and dream of a variety of different possibilities and how it is we come alongside those that are dealing with homelessness and all of the factors that are part of what it means to be homeless, what it means to be invisible, what it means to be displaced in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And it was hearing these stories that were literally rising from the ashes. These women and these children that came from nothing and who were nothing, that rose to be something. I remember Candace. <laughs> Candace had come from generational poverty where her parents and her grandparents had experienced homelessness from time to time. She became pregnant at an early age. She was thro thrown out of her home because she was pregnant and she found herself homeless. She had her daughter when she was 17, and both her and her daughter were homeless. They had no place to go, no place to turn to. Somehow, they learned of Friends of Youth, and they made their way to the housing facility. And it was there for two years that I had the privilege of being a part of Candace and her daughter's life. Now, even though Candace now had a home, she had a place to stay, and more stability in her life. The reality was her life wasn't perfect. There were many more details to iron out. There were new skills to learn, a child to raise. She began to ask questions like, what would permanent housing look like? What would she do for work long term? And sh could she go back to school? And at the end of our time working together, we had the wonderful opportunity to celebrate the reality that Candace had her own apartment. She had completed a certificate program in a trade school nearby. And she had a steady job that provided for both her and her daughter. Her story wasn't perfect. Her life wasn't perfect. There were still challenges and struggles and things ahead that she had to press through and find a way around. But her story was one of those that rose out of ashes. She was slated for a life of nothing. And out of her circumstances, she made something of her life. And she invited me to be a part of that. That's what it is to be a minister. That's what it is to be a therapist, is to come alongside people, to be invited into those intimate, personal spaces of suffering and struggle. <coughs> it wasn't just the fact that she found housing accomplished finishing school and found a sustainable job for her and her daughter, but it was the reality that she had this tremendous amount of courage to keep trying. When things didn't quite go her way, she had the courage to try again. And she had the grace and the dignity to rise up above the challenges that she faced. It was these stories that captivated me that compelled me, that opened my eyes to compassion. It was stories like Candace's that made me realize that I didn't want to be a person on the sideline anymore, but I wanted to be a person fully engaged in the life of those that are suffering, especially those that are invisible, that are marginalized. And so what I realized 
as the, although the vehicle might look differently in terms of what it is to be a minister and what it is to be a therapist, the reality is that the call to either of these vocations is a call to be an agent of healing. This idea is, it is the call to be with. It is a call to get off the sidelines and to be active participants by seeing, hearing, and joining others in their suffering and pain. And this is where I see the similarities between the vocations of pastoral ministry and therapy to be. Is that no matter what path you decide to go, they're both that hold to the call of being an agent of healing. To be an agent of healing, you have to be able to do a few things. You have to be a listener. You have to be a sojourner. You have to be an advocate. And you must be a dreamer. Let me talk about those a little bit more in depth. To be an agent of healing, you have to be able to listen. What I mean by listening is to be the kind of listener is one that can quiet all other distractions. To listen is to quiet the distractions of self, as well as to quiet the distractions of the outward world. Essentially, it is creating a space where all the competing voices are silenced and the focus is solely and completely on the storyteller. And it is in these moments that the participant is joining with, joining with in the desire and seeking work to understand another story and experiences. This is a practical means in which we communicate to the other that you are not alone. That your story, it has a value, it has meaning, it has a place in this world. You are not alone. I hear you. I see you. I want to understand. Listening takes a tremendous amount of discipline. And it takes the ability to process the emotions and the transference that arises in you to be able to clear a way to hear the other. You also have to be a sojourner. A sojourner is a person who is committed to the work of being with. It's essentially a ministry of presence. It's being comfortable with the silent moments when words fail to articulate the activity that is going on in the inner world. It's holding tears and joining the other in the mucky, muddy, darkest crevices of the human story and human existence. In fact, we see this modeled by Mother Teresa in her work in Calcutta, where sometimes there were no words. But the act of ministry and the act of healing and the act of care was to just be with, to wipe the tears off the individual. She modeled this for us in her ministry of presence, cleaning and feeding the homeless in Calcutta, the untouchables of Indian society. To be a healing agent, you have to be an advocate. And what I mean by this is that you cannot be okay with injustice in our world. This aspect is focused on working in opposition of evil and the ways that evil desires to thwart an individual's potential and hopes. Several years back, 
as I was the director of the community center and also working as a pastor at Quest Church, I had an individual that we'd been working with through the community center there come to me late in the evening. I was there late because I was engaged in some of our church meetings. And I saw her make a beeline towards the back of the cafe and I realized that something was a little bit off. And I, when I went to approach her, what I noticed is that her face was black and blue. She had some scrapes under her eyes. She didn't look very good. And so I sat down with her immediately and began to ask what it was that happened to her. And she began to share with me that several days before, downtown, she'd been raped. She was left in an alley. And there was no one there to help her, no one to intercede on her behalf. She sustained, obviously, the physical realities of this abuse and trauma against her body, but she also sustained something in her soul as well. Because what the rape essentially did for her is it began to plant a seed of doubt in her. It began to make her question and to have doubt about her very worth and her very value. It undermined her ability to trust people, to trust the police, to trust social workers at the hospital, to trust other church people, and so on. The doubt wove itself around her until she became completely depressed and immo immobile. Our jobs as advocates is to speak against such evil evil that would undermine an individual's potential to live fully into their call and into who they're created to be. To be an agent of healing, you have to be a dreamer. You have to be a wild, crazy person like dreamer. And what I mean by that is that you have to have hope. To dream is to hold to hope, sometimes on behalf of the individual, until they are ready to hold to hope on their own. It is the belief that suffering, evil, and the human struggle do not have to win. Earlier on when I shared a part of that excerpt from that letter, that woman that I worked with who was coming out of a, a domestic violence relationship, it began at the moment she walked to my doors. That hope began to spring alive the moment that she walked in my doors because that was the biggest step. The courage that it took to walk through that door and to share her story and her experience, not knowing what she would get on the other side. To be a healing agent, you have to be able to dream. Are there distinctions in the work of a minister and a therapist? Yes. There are. There are different roles, different hats, different ways in which um, we're called to engage in those different vocations. The roles of these vocations take on different shapes, and I believe that it is a necessity to the progress of the work at hand. However, these two roles, my faith, my ministry, and the work that I do as a therapist, they both inform each other all the time. In fact, after I started my private practice, it began making me think a little bit about what is private practice. I began really beginning to wrestle with this idea that private practice is really something that's only accessible to those 
that have the means. So what does that mean for those that aren't able to access that kind of care, that kind of treatment? What does that mean for us as pr practitioners? How do we as therapists challenge even our own community to think a little bit more courageously and outside the box in terms of how it is we engage private practice? The works of compassion and justice very much inform how it is I engage people in my private practice setting. Likewise, as a minister, there are times when I'm leading someone into prayerful confession and reliance on God. And my counseling training helps me in those moments sometimes. Because it helps me to fully see how it is that fear is internalized in the individual. And how it is that fear might inform an individual to resist. God's presence, or to resist engaging me. Both vehicles inform each other, and though I may find myself at times switching hats between the two, getting creative, and maybe using a little of what I know from this section to help, it, help me in this department, the reality is, is that at the end of the day, my call is larger than that of a therapist or minister. My call is to be an agent of healing. And however it is that God calls me in those moments, in those times, I want to be faithful and wise to be able to step through those moment-to-moment -moment calls in my life. That's, that's my story for you, and I want to give we're right at 4.45, so I want to be able to give you an opportunity to ask me any questions you might have. And again, thank you for being here with me this afternoon. Questions? Yeah. I, I see right now um, the calling is broader to be in these roles um, and how there's a lot of kind of dovetailing things going back and forth. Uh, are, are there any examples where you feel like sometimes the law does come up or just, <coughs> so these hats are different too? So what are some examples where, um, where it feels like, oh, this is a job of a minister, this is not the job of you know, therapy for the most person? Yeah. Uh, I think that. It looks very different to be part of an individual story um, in a minister capacity than in a therapeutic capacity for lots of different reasons. I think to be in relationship with someone from a ministry capacity means that I'm kind of part of a community, a family. And so it allows me to be a part of different aspects of their lives in a different way. Like typically as a therapist, I'm not going to get invited to birthday parties or anniversaries or weddings. But oftentimes, as a minister, sometimes not always, but oftentimes as a minister, I do get invited to some of those places to be able to engage people in kind of their day-to-day -day lives and celebrations and those kinds of things. And so um, I find that that's one of the big differences of, of the different aspects of my vocations is how I get to engage people in their day-to-day -day journeys or in their lives, how I get to celebrate them. There's so much in the private practice setting that I won't be able to see that I only get to hear in that hour um, slot of time that we have at that very moment, but I won't be able to see tangibly by being a part of their celebrations or their times of transition, like funerals or moving or those other kinds of aspects of life. So those are some of the differences. Do you have um, clients who are on the members? Um, I try to keep very strong boundaries around that, though I do get, it's, it's not rare for me to get um, folks 
uh, referring, doing self-referral through the church because people know me at the church and so they trust me, they know me. Oftentimes moving into kind of a therapeutic setting can be scary and so it feels more comforting to know someone and to be familiar with someone. Um, but I try to keep those boundaries pretty strong. Um, however, I do take the time to talk individually. So there might be some cases and there might be some circumstances where I find that it might be appropriate to, to talk about, about um, moving into kind of more of a formal therapeutic um, relationship with someone as well. That's been a bit of a learning curve for me over the last several years. Um, how's it different to work with a client is the question Yeah, I think that's a really, I mean, obviously, with someone who is a person of faith, there is kind of a common law language that oftentimes gets shared, and I have an understanding of where they're coming from, or kind of their thought process, or what they're wrestling with, and what they're struggling with, as, as opposed to someone who might be coming out of a space of not being a believer. They're not going to use the same kind of language for some of their struggles or fears. Um, but I often find that the topic of spirituality is something that um, we talk about uh, even with those that are non-believing. Any other questions? Yeah. I was just so uh, moved by the stories that you shared about the women that you work with. So thank you very much for that very elementary question coming at it from a, I'm not a clinician, but it's something I've been curious about for some time. When you're working with women, do you find women want to feel felt? They want to they want you to attune with them so that you're resonating with that feeling that they're having. And so in doing that and developing that relationship, you put yourself at risk in a way to share those emotions. So what do you do for yourself that keeps you vibrant? and able to do this wonderful work. I have a good therapist myself. <laughs> and just really, I, I mean, I try to keep strong boundaries and know kind of what my limits are, know how I need to process. I have also a supervisor that I work with that I can talk through, because there are some, sometimes that there are some heavy, heavy things that are going on in the client's life. and. Um, Sometimes I need another space to be able to process and share someone else to hold with me the stories that I'm trying to bear and hold on to as well. And then in the ministry setting, one of the things that I'm really grateful for at Quest is that we have a really strong pastoral team and, and larger staff. And so we're getting together weekly, um, twice a week actually, where we get the opportunity to share a little bit more some of the burdens that we're facing with, with individuals within the community and really to ask the bigger question, how can we be praying for people? How can we be coming alongside people um, as a pastoral staff? That no one's meant to shoulder these situations or to be in isolation on their own. I have a few more minutes if there's any other questions. <laughs> 